All right. The Kosovo Specialist Chambers is now in session. Please be seated. Good afternoon and welcome everyone in and outside the courtroom. Madam Court Officer, can you please call the case? Good afternoon, Your Honor. This is case KSC BC 2020-06, the Specialist Prosecutor versus Hashim Tachi, Kadri Veseli, Recep Selimi, and Jakub Krasnici. Thank you, Madam Court Officer. Now I would kindly ask the parties and participants to introduce themselves, starting with the Specialist Prosecutor's Office. Madam Prosecutor. Good afternoon, Your Honor, and to all of those joining. For the Specialist Prosecutor's Office this afternoon are Alan Teeger, Senior Prosecutor, Ward Ferdinandus, Head of Investigations Prosecutions, Marlene Yaya Haga, Legal and Disclosure Officer, and I am Claire Lawson, Senior Prosecutor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. And now I turn to the defense. May counsel introduce themselves and their team, starting Mr. with Mr. Kihu, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor, and uh, good afternoon to everybody in the courtroom. My name is Gregory Kiho. I'm here with uh, Mr. Prosper, Pierre Prosper in person, and also uh, Luka Mishetic and Dostit Palaska, who are on the uh, video monitor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Uh, Mr. Emerson, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor, to those inside of the courtroom and following remotely. My name is Ben Emerson. I'm representing uh, Kadri Vasili together with my co-counsel, Andrew Strong, who appears remotely. Uh, and we're here today in court with legal advisor Joanna Frevet and our case manager, Pascal Langlais. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Young, please. Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, I appear for Mr. Recep Salimi, along with Mr. Jeffrey Roberts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. And Ms. Alagendra, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Vectesh Ray Alagendra for Mr. Yakub Krasici, appearing together with Mr. Eden Ellis, Mr. Mentor Bichiri, and Mr. Victor Baesu. Thank you, Ms. Alagendra. Uh, and uh, for the record, I note that Mr. Thatchi, Mr. Vizili, Mr. Selimi, and Mr. Krasniki are not physically present in the courtroom, but attend this hearing via video conference. Now I turn to the Council for Victims. Mr. Laws, please. Good afternoon, Your Honour, and to everyone joining us. Final Laws Council for the participating victims in this case. Thank you, Mr. Laws. Now I turn to the registry. Mr. Roche, please. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honour. Uh, my name is Ralph Roche, Head of Judicial Services Division in the Registry. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Roche. And for the record, I'm Nicolas Guillou, pretrial judge for this case. On 8 September 2021, I scheduled the seventh status conference. I asked the parties to provide written submissions if they so wished. On 13 September, the SPO and the defense for Mr. Krasnici submitted their written observations. I thank these parties for their written submissions. The purpose of our hearing today is, as usual, to review the status of the case and to discuss the topics on the agenda, specifically disclosure, translations, SPO investigations, defense investigations, and detention. I will invite the parties to present their views in a concise fashion about each item. And I remind the parties to give prior notice should any submissions require the disclosure of confidential information so we can go into private or closed session. Let us start with the first topic that was listed in the scaling order, which is disclosure. I will give the floor to the parties on the disclosure of each category of evidentiary material separately. 
First, the Rule 1021A material, which is the evidentiary material filed with the indictment. Then the 1021B material, which is the evidentiary material the SPO intends to use at trial. Then the Rule 1023 material, which is the material relevant to the case as listed by the SPO. Then the Rule 1023 material, which is the exculpatory material. And finally, the Rule 107 material, which is protected material for which the consent of the provider is requested. Let us start with the Rule 1021A material, which has already been disclosed by the SPO. The defense requested an expansion of subcategorization in legal workflow to include Rule 1021A material that uh, was already discussed during the previous status conference. I would like to hear from the defense if they still consider this subcategorization to be necessary to prepare their case. I note that the Krasniki defense indicated in its submissions that a provisional witness list and witness packages of document would be of a higher priority for the defense that than sorry, the categorization of Rule 1021A material. Finally, I would like the SPO to indicate the impact of the subcategorization to the extension of the subcategorization to the Rule 101A material on their current disclosure deadline. I will first start with the defense. Mr. Kihui, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor. On behalf of uh, uh, Mr. Thachi, uh, we would still uh, urge the court to order that the 1021A materials be uh, given to us in categorization under the legal flow. The problem uh, as I see this, yes, this information has been disclosed under Rule 86 uh, 3B. However, when we look at the actual document, Your Honor, it has any number of footnotes throughout it. In fact, there, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, my colleagues, but there are 4,133 footnotes. And in those footnotes, they have lines of information concerning heaven knows what. And what we have before us is really a potpourri of information that is not broken down as it is in the is in the, the disclosures under you know under B one. It's just an array of information. And what we are trying to do is pinpoint what exactly the prosecutor is relying on with the information that's coming across the transom to us on a 1021A. It's virtually impossible with over 4,000 uh, 4, footnotes. And these aren't just footnotes, and I'm sure Your Honor knows this. It, these aren't just footnotes. There are footnotes that have scores of, of notations, of witnesses, of information, and it's it, virtually impossible to categorize that information vis-a-vis -vis what is in the Rule 86 information as a whole. So in an effort to streamline matters, not only now, but in the courtroom setting, it would be immensely helpful for the court to order the prosecution to take that information and put it in a categorization in the same fashion or similar fashion that they've done with the, the 1B material so that it can be used in an expeditious and fair fashion uh, on behalf of all the accused, not the least of which is my client, Mr. Thachi. And I welcome any questions, Your Honor. I just want it to be brief. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Mr. Emerson, please, on this topic of uh, 101A and the subcategorization. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Your Honor, in, in general terms, as you will be aware, there's been a flurry of late disclosure from the prosecution, which we'll no doubt deal with in due course. But I'm going to, if I may, uh, um, delegate to Mr. Strong the detailed answers to the questions that uh, you've posed uh, in A to D uh, and, and, and re return to the, the more general questions at the end. Thank you. Mr. Strong, please, on this uh, topic of the subcategorization. Yes, uh, good, 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 good afternoon. Uh, I think, in general, uh, we agree with the submissions made just previously by Mr. Keogh. Uh, we hope it's not an either-or uh, proposition, where either we're getting the, the witness lists in a timely manner, or we're getting the, the, the subcategorizations. Uh, 
one of the real benefits of subcategorization is it, in the categories that have been applied to the evidence. It allows you to, to search the entire body uh, uh, of, of evidence that's been disclosed. So if there's a corner of that evidence that isn't categorized, that, that, that isn't able to turn up in a, in a category search, uh, that, that's going to be an issue um, that, that we'll have to deal with. Um, and I'll leave my comments on that matter there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Uh, Mr. Young, please. Yes, thank you, Your Honour. Yes, in general terms, we do support the oral submissions of Mr. Kehoe on behalf of Mr. Thatchy and the written submissions of Mr. Krasniki in paragraphs five and six of their filing. Um, it would be immensely helpful to have the expanded subcategorization in my respectful submission. Uh, obviously, it's more important that the prosecution complete the rest of their disclosure obligations, um, but uh, expanding the subcategorization would be an obvious and useful uh, piece of case management, good case management. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Mr. Lagandra, knowing that you filed the initial request on this uh, topic, you have the floor. Your Honor, could I uh, request for Mr. Ellis to address Your Honor on this? Mr. Ellis, please. Your Honor, yes, we, we filed the initial request on this and, and we still stand by the submissions made both orally and in writing at the last status conference uh, and indeed support the oral submissions made today uh, by the other defence teams. Um, the, the, the point in short is that whilst there remains uh, a body of material on workflow uh, that is not subject to the categorisation, uh, then the usefulness of categorisation as a means of searching uh, is diminished uh, and that affects all the defence teams um, and indeed anyone else who, who wishes to carry out searches uh, using the categorization function. Uh, so we would submit that it, it, it remains beneficial. Um, of course it would take some time to impose the categorizations, um, but we still submit spending that time now uh, will be of assistance to all parties and participants going forward. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Uh, let me give the floor to the SPO. Madam Prosecutor. Thank you, Your Honour. On this topic, we have previously outlined the reasons why we do not consider that subcategorization of um, Rule 102.1a material is warranted and why we do not consider it to be a good use of limited resources, certainly at the present time. The relevance of the Rule 102.1a materials is not only addressed in the um, uh, Rule, Rule 86.3b outline, um, which was mentioned by the Thatchy defence, but the material in question has been available to the defence for review and analysis for approximately nine months now. Um, the footnotes referred to by the Thatchy defence are not abstract entities, obviously, they support particular assertions that are made in that outline, and the outline is broken down in detail by count and by site. It's, it is, therefore, relatively easy to determine, in fact, very easy to determine which footnotes relate to each site and to which count, and we therefore do maintain our prior position. There are approximately 1,800 items disclosed under Rule 102.1a and our experience to date has been that subcategorization, which is done manually, would be a resource intensive exercise. Certainly at the current time it's not something which can be done without depleting resources uh, needed to meet other requirements in this case. The Vaselli defence mentioned an either or, and uh, unfortunately at this stage of proceedings it is an either or. Um, but in that regard we note the indication from both the Kresnici and Salimi defence teams that certain other matters would be of higher priority for them. And that indication is helpful to us because it is our constant position that where there are additional steps we can take above what is required by the framework. We are always willing to do that um, where it would be genuinely useful to the other parties and where we can figure out a way of doing it 
that doesn't seriously compromise our ability to fulfill ongoing obligations. And we also thank the Krasnichi Defense for recent inter-parties exchanges. Certain of the proposals and other matters that they have raised with us have been very helpful. We're certainly happy to continue those discussions and we're hopeful that we will be able to reach solutions on a number of them. The defense filing um, mentioned what those issues are and anticipated being able to update the court on progress at the ne next status conference. So just to note that we agree that is likely to be the case that we would be in a position to provide further updates to the court. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Mr. Kihu. Yes, sir. Briefly, Your Honor, please. Just, just briefly, Your Honor. Uh, basically, what the prosecution is arguing is that we don't want to go into this subcategorization because it's difficult or it's time consuming. Well, if it's difficult and time consuming for the prosecution, it's impossible for us. There are scores of information, and I, I know Your Honor is acutely aware of that document and the amount of information that are in those footnotes that we have to sift through and try to discern exactly what the, what the prosecution is going to do with that, all those uh, pieces of information and where they fit into the slots. And we don't want to do it because it's too hard. I submit to Your Honor that that is not a quality of arms, especially since they're making a disclosure under you know, uh, 1021A and they plan on using that information and pointing to those, those run-on run footnotes to say, look, we disclosed it here but they're not telling us what category it falls into. I appreciate the difficulty with it. I appreciate the difficulty because we tried to go through it ourselves to make the same conclusions. But this is the prosecution's information, and we submit to the court that it is incumbent upon them to break this down and give us some subcategorization so we can have an idea when we walk into trial what issues they're going to invent, what evidence they're going to advance and uh, on what issues. And I think that's just on a quality of arms basis, uh, I submit to the court that uh, we follow that procedure as we followed for the 1021B items. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Does any or the defense team want the floor to reply? I don't see any request. Thank you, uh, Madam Prosecutor. Briefly, please, then. Uh, very briefly, Your Honor. I would just like to note that there was a slight misrepresentation of what our submissions were. It's not that we don't want to do it, it's that we have in fact already done it in the outline, broken down to a degree of detail that is in fact uh, more categorized than what would be done in the subcategorization required for legal workflow. And my submission was simply that at the current time, we simply do not have the resources without taking from other obligations which are higher priority, at least for certain of the defense teams, to transfer the work from the outline which is already available into the legal workflow format. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Let us now move to the Rule 1021B material. I would like to hear what progress has been made in the disclosure of this category of material. I note that the SPO has disclosed 24 packages of Rule 1021B material, but that there are still outstanding material to be disclosed. In light of the approaching uh, deadline of 27 2021, I would like the SPO to indicate how much of such material remains to be disclosed today, how much of such material will remain to be disclosed after the deadline of 27 September 2021, if any. If the list of material in paragraph three of its written submissions is exhaustive, and I remind all the parties that the list contains first the statements of three international witnesses for which Rule 107 clearances is still pending, two, reports from three expert witnesses relating to forensic matters, and three certain materials which were the subject of requests for variation of protective measures. And finally, if the list is not exhaustive, I'd like the SPO to indicate what are the outstanding Rule 101B materials to be disclosed. 
I also invite the SPO to indicate if it requests a further extension of the deadline of 27 September, and if so, for what Rule 1021B material. I also take from the SPO submissions that translation of Rule 1021B materials will not be fully completed by the current deadline of 27 September and that the SPO consequently requests an extension of deadline for disclosure of remaining translations. I invite the SPO to give details on the expected timeline for these translations to be finalized. Finally, I note that the SPO indicated in its written submissions that no further protective measure requests in respect of Rule 1021B material will be necessary in order to complete disclosure of such material. I invite the SPO to confirm its written submissions on this point. Madam Prosecutor, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Honour. As you noted, since the last status conference, 24 packages of Rule 1021B material have been disclosed and a number of further packages are currently being processed for disclosure by the deadline of the 27th of September. With respect to the specific matters which had been identified at the last status conference, significant progress has been made. Two of the international witnesses have been cleared and disclosed. Documentary evidence which had been the subject of Rule 107 restri restrictions has been cleared and disclosed. Outstanding applications for protective measures have been made and the material in question has been or will be disclosed by the deadline. And finally, variations of protective measures have been obtained in respect of materials relating to five witnesses. And again, those materials have been or will be disclosed by the deadline. We also expect that the reports from the three experts will be obtained within the 27th of September deadline. However, as indicated in our filing, there is a possibility that certain e-redactions may be necessary with respect to the names of victims in the expert reports. We have not yet seen um, the reports, so we're not in a position to confirm whether that's the case or to make any relevant application. But should it prove necessary, we will do so at the earliest opportunity as soon as the reports are received. That is the only outstanding protective measures issue that we can foresee, which is relevant to our ability to disclose the remaining Rule 1021B materials. There are, as Your Honour... So, sorry to interrupt. On this issue, would you file one protective measure request, or would you uh, need several of them, uh, depending on the different uh, reports? Are you able to uh, make one consolidated filing on this? We are hoping to be able to make one consolidated filing depending on the date of receipt. We wouldn't like to um, delay making the application if, for example, one of the reports is arriving later than anticipated. But we would hope to do a consolidated filing, yes. As Your Honour noted, there are um, a number of items which we identified in our filing where we are not yet in a position to confirm that the necessary clearances or variations will be complete. And these are three international witnesses for whom the clearance process remains ongoing and is being actively worked on. Unfortunately, we can't right now confirm whether those clearances will come through by the 27th. For example, one of the witnesses is currently traveling in a relatively remote location um, with a limited access to materials and that may impact his availability for interacting with the organizations who are um, attempting to clear the materials. In addition to those three international witnesses, there is one witness in respect of whom litigation for variation of protective measures remains ongoing. For that witness, we are hopeful of having clearance to disclose the individual's SPO interview by the deadline. 
but it is uncertain whether certain prior testimony will be available by that date. It is a matter that's pending further judicial determination at a different institution. And finally, there are six individuals for whom we have already disclosed their prior transcripts. And we sought a variation of protective measures in order to be able to disclose lesser redacted versions of those transcripts which are already disclosed. The request has been granted, but we are waiting um, receipt of the materials. And we understand that preparing them is a fairly painstaking matter. So we don't have confirmation from the third party as to whether they will manage to have them prepared and provided to us by the relevant deadline. Those are the matters where there is currently some uncertainty as to whether or not we will be able to meet the 27th of September deadline. As indicated by Your Honour and uh, in our filing, we are already seeking an extension of deadline in respect of translations. And translation um, of Rule 102 material is ongoing. It's being treated as an absolute priority for the translation team and has been their priority for many months. Um, all available translation resources are being devoted to it and we're constantly seeking to expand and maximize those resources. I am not able to provide Your Honour with a precise estimate, but I can say that the work is expected to continue for a number of months in light of the volume of material. We will continue to disclose translations on a rolling basis as soon as they become available and once any redactions as relevant have been applied and I'm available for any um, further questions Your Honour may have. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. One follow-up question. Can you confirm that the list of Rule 2.1b material that you uh, mentioned is exhaustive? That the one that will not be able to be disclosed by the deadline of 27 September, there is nothing that you haven't mentioned uh, today during the status conference? That I, is I, I mentioned this because in your written sorry in your written submissions it is mentioned includes and you know the term including uh, is sometimes misleading. Absolutely, Your Honour, and um, including was deliberate in this instance because there are a number of other materials relating to variation of protective measures which I haven't mentioned here today, but I haven't mentioned them because we do believe that we will have them and have them disclosed by the deadline. So the items that I have mentioned are exhaustive in terms of what we anticipate there is un real uncertainty about. Thank you. Thank you very much. And regarding the translations, you mentioned several months. Do I take it that this would go uh, beyond uh, the end of the year, or do you see this as a question of uh, two or three months so that the defense can have an idea of what to expect? Our current estimates um, would aim to complete the translations within this year. Um, I, I can't be firm due to the nature of the work and some documents, they just take longer to translate than other documents. Um, our, certainly our intention and um, the planning is to have them completed by December, but as I said, I, I'm not in a position to give um, a firm answer on that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Let me turn to the defense. Mr. Kihu, please, on the 1021B material. Yes, Your Honor, on behalf of uh, Mr. Thachi, I, I, I'm still not clear, uh, Your Honor, what is the volume of material we're supposed to get by the 27th of September. Uh, I will bring to the Court's attention that, uh, and I'm, pardon me if I misspeak at any point, uh, but I tried to get uh, caught up with the last status conference that Your Honor held where the prosecution made a statement in their submission to Your Honor that uh, they were substantially on track with respect to Rule 1021B disclosures. Uh, and what has happened as a result is that since that hearing, or shortly thereafter, 
uh, we received 11,000, over 11,000 documents, and 10,000 of those were both 1021A and B. Uh, with regard to the 1021B, uh, there were 11,300 that we've received since July the 24th uh, of 2021. Uh, 8,542 were, were, uh, uh, 1B, were 1B items. That's 75% of the documents that we've gotten that are 1021 b documents, excuse me, B1 documents, uh, were received after the last hearing, which, of course, which was the initial deadline that Your Honor had. And I, I understand that, that Your Honor did, in fact, put the deadline out until the 27th, but to get 75% of the uh, documents that fall under B B1 uh, during that time frame gives me some pause. And certainly it plays into Your Honor's request for notice under uh, uh, 101, 10, excuse me, Rule 1023, because we haven't had anywhere near the amount of time to digest this. So while this is, you know, 8,542 documents, that's not 8,542 pages. These are documents, multi-page document, and it's simply impossible uh, to get our arms around this when uh, we think we are getting near disclosure, and lo and behold, after the last status conference, we got 75% of the B-1 documents that came to us. And as we sit here today with the deadline of the 27th of September, it's not clear again what we are going to get at that point, how that plays into Your Honor's request on a 1023 for, for notice, which frankly at this point is impossible to have. And what are we going to get on a delayed basis down the line? If in fact there is a delay, and I know there's a delay for uh, non-disclosure, I believe for, for some time, what kind of volume of information are we talking about uh, in that realm? Um, are we talking about thousands of documents? Are we talking about a handful of documents? I put these on the table, Judge, because it, it seems to be a, a uh, running process of, yes, there's going to be disclosure at a certain point. No, there's not a disclosure. We need more time. And then they hit us with an array of documents that, even as we sit here today, are virtually impossible to get our arms around to, to, to sit down and speak with you cogently about what's in them. And the, the concern yet further on behalf of Mr. Thatchi is how much more of this is going to happen, how much more of this is coming down the line. And I know some of my colleagues uh, are concerned about this as well. We have conversed about this disclosure in the, uh, that's going on over such a long period of time and when will it come to an end so we can sit down with my client who wants to know, you know, what, what is going to be the evidence as opposed to something that just goes on indefinitely. That's the biggest concern that we have. What are we, what are we looking at here and what are we going to get? And I'll give the floor to my other, I'll turn the floor back to you, Your Honor, for further questions of my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Q. And I think you, you pointed an important point that's exactly the reason why I asked the SPO what were the remaining documents. And I asked if it was exhaustive or not, because I had the same concern. What's left? Yes. And is it like 75%, uh, 25%, 2%? That's the uh, information that I wanted to get. Uh, Mr. Emerson or Mr. Strong? If I could just say a few words at the outset. Um, <clears throat> again, I think just to pick up on that last exchange between yourself and Mr. Kehoe, we were all listening at attentively to determine whether the prosecution was regarding paragraph three of its uh, submission as exhaustive. But of course that relates to material for which they currently anticipate ex uh, seeking a yet further extension beyond the 27th. And the immediate concern which we haven't heard an answer from from the prosecution is yet how much more is there to be disclosed between now and that deadline? And, and you, I'm, 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 I don't wish to be in I told you so mode, but Your Honour will recall the early st stages of the hearings in this case, uh, when the prosecution was still robustly claiming they would be ready for trial by now. right? And when I said, look, experience shows, and we gave you statistics from all of the other tribunals, uh, that the time frames that these things tend to take expand, uh, the prosecution repeatedly, Mr. Black himself uh, stood Mr. up. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, I'm sorry, it's the same problem again. 
uh, Mr. Smith himself, um, uh, 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 as well as my then friend on the opposite side of the courtroom for the prosecution today, stood there uh, and said to your face that the whole purpose of the way this tribunal was being run was to ensure that no such delays would occur uh, and that they would be ready for trial right now. And what we have had is that in the 11th hour, that is literally the last month before the deadline is due to expire, 75% of the prosecution case. Now, these men have been in custody since November. Uh, and they've been in custody on the basis of a case that the prosecution wasn't disclosing. And I said to Your Honour at the time, we need to take account of how long the pre-trial process is going to be. And the prosecution responded that I and the other uh, defence counsel were deliberately manufacturing the risk of false delay in order to justify applications for provisional release. I'd like to hear an apology. I've asked for it before. I see a counsel who was in the courtroom who made the allegation is here today. I'd like to hear her apologise to the defendants for them being in custody for this length of time on the basis of an undisclosed case, uh, to the court and to the defence for misleading in terms of what it was precisely that the case was. I mean, the prosecution have known throughout all those hearings that that 75% of their case was not disclosed. They've known that. They're the ones who know what they've got and what they're using. And they misled you. There's no way around it. They misled us all. And, and, and I see everybody behaving as though this were just normality, that we should accept this as normal. It is abnormal, profoundly abnormal, for responsible prosecutors to behave in this way. I'm sorry, but it is. And I see not the slightest sign of contrition or acknowledgement from the other side of the courtroom, or frankly concern from your honour about the lack of uh, prosecutorial professionalism. And it needs to be said. Something needs to be recorded, not just from me, because everybody knows that I'm always complaining about it and always have been since the beginning, but since we're now standing here, just before the 11th hour, which you've already extended, where we've been receiving 75% of the case, and in my client's case, direct evidence relating to allegations against him that were withheld for, 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 for all of the months that these gentlemen have been in custody, something needs to properly to be said to, in order to maintain the credibility of this tribunal because people are watching all over the world to see how this tribunal conducts itself and if the pre-trial judge sits here and watches the prosecution behave like that says and does nothing about it other than to ask them how long it is going to be before the next time they ask for an extension we are all of us in the situation where well, we know you know now that I, we were right there's no possibility of a trial starting before the summer of next year because the prosecution is only now starting to disclose its actual case. So I know, it, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting it's the bench's fault. It's clearly the prosecution's fault. But there is a responsibility for this tribunal as a, I appreciate it's a national court rather than an international court, and that will become very important in due course, but it is being watched by the international community. And there are very real concerns, and there are very real concerns about the integrity, and I'll use the word clearly, of the prosecution. What kind of prosecution tells you they're substantially on track in July, having held these men in custody since November, and then discloses 75% of its evidence in the following week? I'm also curious, just on a matter of principle, why it should be that we are being told that there will be many months before the prosecution can disclose the translated 1021B material. It's a curious thing because, as, as I've understood the position, 1021B, in, in, in the prosecution will have already decided that it is going to use that material at trial. Otherwise, it wouldn't be 1021B. How have they done that without a translation? Are you being given an honest appraisal? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Uh, I turn to Mr. Young, please. 
So in light of the submissions of Mr. Kehoe and Mr. Emerson, I can be very brief. In short, um, we fully share the concerns expressed by Mr. Kehoe and Mr. Emerson. And there are, and uh, indeed, you are asked the question as well. Um, there are extraordinary concerns over not just the volume of the material, but the content of the material we still haven't had disclosed and how that will impact upon what needs to be tr translated into either Albanian or English in terms of priority documentation is a massive issue. You may remember at the last status conference, I flagged up that the, the issue of the tribunal's capacity to translate into the language of the accused is an absolute um, essential um, for the court. And I warned the court, uh, I advised the court that there may be a need for significant or substantial new resources because the, the, the capacity of the court to translate priority materials is obviously um, being stretched, if not, um, it's simply not working at present. And, and this is without even, uh, this is where we already have a massive backlog of translations. And before the prosecution have still to pin their colors to the mask and to name the witnesses, to identify the exhibits that they will for sure be relying upon in court in relation to the specific allegations. So when I said last time, this is a major Achilles heel of the tribunal, I, I wasn't underestimating it. I think it's a really a real concern and it's something that your honor should take into account, especially given that these men are in custody uh, and given that um, there is um, such a, a lack of knowledge over the case that there is against them. They're entitled to know what the case is against them and given the way the prosecution have behaved, respectively, the least that the court can do to mitigate the damage is to release these men with conditions. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Ms. Salagan, how Mr. Ellis, please. Uh, you, Your Honour, we, we share the concerns expressed by the other defence teams and, and do join with them. Um, particularly also in, in, in relation to the issue of the translation of 102.1b material into English um, as the working language of these proceedings. Uh, the 102.1b process can't be regarded as complete um, until those translations have been provided to the defence. Um, it obviously limits our ability to work on the documents, uh, our ability to review and analyse what, what we're being given. Um, if those documents are not made available in the working language uh, of, of the court, um, of, of proceedings. Um, and to hear that there's many months still to go, or months to go before those translations are finished, um, should be a source of real concern. Your Honour. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Uh, let me turn to the prosecution. And, Madam Prosecutor, if you could specifically answer the question of Mr. MSM regarding the amount of Rule 102.1b material to be disclosed before the deadline of 27 September, because you've been very clear on what will probably not be disclosed at that date, but in terms of, especially in terms of quantity, because I think it was a concern shared by all the defense teams, what is, uh, what is coming in the following weeks before the uh, deadline? And then I give you the floor to also uh, respond to all the uh, concerns of the uh, defense. Madam Prosecutor. I will start with that specific question. Um, I, I don't have the precise figure in terms of the number of items, but it is not a large figure. What we are talking about now is materials that we are um, waiting to receive um, from variation requests. So it's not that we have a current backlog of um, materials to be processed or packages that are impending. Um, to give an approximation, I was um, attempting, um, well, the um, I was attempting just now to give some approximation of it, and I believe there are prior statements or testimonies uh, related to approximately fifteen witnesses um, that we that have been the subject of variation requests and that we hope to have received and processed by the deadline. Um, and then there are the, men the items that I specifically mentioned earlier in the hearing. So it is not a large volume of material. 
Um, turning to the other points that were made, disclosure of Rule 102.1b material was provided on, an, on a rolling basis. As explained at the last status conference, there were a number of factors which impacted the frequency and timing of those disclosures. The first was the requirement for subcategorization, which included both going back over previously disclosed or processed packages, as well as building that requirement into the future packages that we were preparing. And the second was the need to prioritize the processing of witness materials that necessitated protective measures. Due to the significantly more time consuming nature of the review process for those materials, and the need to make relevant applications to the court. It is also the case that conducting a large-scale review and processing exercise with a majority of staff working remotely due to COVID restrictions and consequently without access to centralized evidence databases and software was an enormously logistically challenging task which vastly increased the time required. A couple of the, de of the defense teams have mentioned the issue of disclosure in this context. So I would just like to note that disclosure is subject to separate ongoing litigation. The legal framework provides a mechanism for very regular review of detention and the continuation of detention is therefore considered on its merits on a regular basis. At this time and based on the last review, circumstances justifying detention have been found to continue to exist and any future reviews will continue to be litigated and considered on their merits on the circumstances that exist at the relevant time and subject to an automatic right of appeal. The SPO has not tethered its estimates on the timing of the trial to detention litigation. On the contrary, our constant position has been that it is irrelevant in light of the regular detention reviews provided by the applicable framework. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Uh, Mr. Kihu, please. Briefly, yes, I, and Your Honor, with all on due, the 101 b material. Yes, on the 102. With all due respect, uh, Your Honor, the, the question I, I asked, and I think my co-counsel asked, under Rule 101b, one, one, excuse me, Rule 102.1b was, oh, what kind of material are we looking at? Counsel just said 15 witnesses, and that covers little i. There is a two, two little i and a three little i that go for witness statements but exhibits. And the question that we all have is, witness statements is fine. What about the attendant exhibits? And what is the volume with that? With the, le with the amount of documents that we received recently, yes, there were witness statements, but there were also scores of other exhibits. So I hate to press the point, Your Honor, but, but what, what are we looking at in that volume, putting aside the 15 witnesses counsel just alluded to? What else is there, and how much is it? <clears throat> Mr. Mason, just before you, I give you the floor, I will just give the opportunity of, to the prosecution to respond to this question, if you can give uh, even an approximative figure, Madam Prosecutor. Unfortunately, I can't be any more precise than I have been because we haven't received the materials. We've requested variation, but we don't know the volume of materials that um, will accompany that request. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Mr. Emerson, please. In, in, in a sense, there we are. It's another example um, uh, of the way in which the prosecution has conducted itself. We, 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 I, I asked for an apology for the way the prosecution misrepresented the position throughout at the outset, and I haven't had one. What I've had instead is a suggestion that the prosecution's constant position has been that the date of trial is unrelated to the procedure, uh, the pre-trial, the length of the pre-trial review. Leaving that entirely aside, everyone in this courtroom, including Your Honour, and everybody watching knows full well that there's been nothing remotely constant about the prosecution's position. If it were the case, we would be ready for trial now. Instead of which, we're being told there is an unquantifiable amount of material still to be served, and that's effectively what you've just been told. It's unquantifiable. 
other than that there are certain specific categories that they already know that they're not going to be in a position to disclose, which somehow include, which I find extremely difficult to understand, a large body of material which has yet to be translated into English, even though the prosecution don't speak Albanian and have made a decision to use that material at trial. Now, there have been various different techniques used by this dishonest prosecution to mislead you about when it was ready for trial. But normalizing this level of prosecutorial professional misconduct is an unacceptable thing for a tribunal to do. Please sit down until I've finished speaking. I think we've heard enough. Please, please do not address each other like that. I mean, you can, you can express your argument, but I'm Mr. I'm trying Mason, to, but I can see that there's an attempt to interrupt me. Is it, unless it's to apologise for the way in which things have been conducted and the allegations that have been made, I wouldn't normally give way. Mr. Emerson, do, did you want to add anything else? Yeah, absolutely. I've been interrupted by counsel standing up in the middle of my submissions. Please continue. We're dealing now with a prosecution that, on any view, lacks all credibility when it makes predictions about the conduct of the case. The fact that the position is being made clear to you today, you, 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 we have an expression in English about lawyers using weasel words. And the document you were submitted very carefully avoided recognizing what you have just elicited from the prosecution, which is that they've got no idea of the volume of material they've still to serve, and that we are still nowhere near knowing what the case against the accused at trial is really going to be. I'm going to have some submissions to make to you in a moment when it comes to the defense investigation, uh, but we are in a situation where we have seen very significant, consistent, high levels of prosecutorial misconduct and something needs to be done to put it to a stop. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Madam Prosecutor, do you want to reply now? Or do you want me to continue with the other defence teams before? Thank you, Honor, Your Honour. My only request was that submissions be made in a civil manner in the courtroom. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. And I remind everyone in this courtroom to please avoid being uh, aggressive towards each other. Uh, let me uh, ask Mr. Young for its uh, submission, if any. Nothing to add, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Ms. Salengenrao, Mr. Ellis, please. Uh, Your Honour, if I may be permitted, uh, I noticed that the SEO is unable, the prosecution is unable to tell us uh, just what the volume of material is. Could we ask the prosecution to clarify if what we have received so far is 75% of the 1021B material. Would that be possible? Thank you, Ms. Alagandra. Let me turn to Madam Prosecutor. Is it an answer that you, a question that you can answer approximately? Um, the question was whether what has been so far received is 75% of the Rule 1021B material. I, I would consider it to be well in excess of 75% of the Rule 1021B material. I don't believe that we have 25% remaining to be disclosed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. I don't see any other defence team requesting the floor. Let us move now to the Rule 1023 Notice and Evidentiary Material. I would like to know whether the parties could provide an update on their progress towards the completion of the procedure for the disclosure of Rule 1023 Material, in particular whether the defence has requested or will request Rule 1023 Material to be disclosed based on the existing notice by 24 September 2021. I note from the SPO submissions that five requests have already been made by the defense and that three of these have already been processed while two are still pending. 
I also note from the Krasniki defense uh, that uh, it will not be ready to make all it rec its requests for access to material uh, from the Rule 1023 notice by 24 September 2021. The Krasniki defense submits that the deadline for requesting access to material from the Rule 1023 notice should in principle be after the last date for the SPO to disclose Rule 1021B material, which is not until 27 September, and after the defense have had fair opportunity to digest the recent voluminous disclosures. And finally, I would like to know whether the defense has indicated or will indicate to the SPO the items on the notice, in the notice, for which further details are needed in accordance with my decision on the defense request for an amended Rule 1023 notice. Madam Prosecutor. Thank you, Your Honor. We have so far received seven Rule 1023 requests. As I'll mention in a moment, we received two more this morning. Three of those have been processed and disclosed, subject to one protective measures application, which was filed on the 24th of August, filing 439. Materials relating to the two other outstanding requests are currently under review and processing. We anticipate disclosing the materials relating to the to Vaselli request 444 within the coming days. And as I mentioned, two further requests were received from the Thatchy defense team a short time ago today. One of the requests is for 440 items and the other is for 2,649 items. We will proceed to review and address them both this is a more voluminous request than those received to date, and we will have to assess whether it can be met within the applicable timeframes. We have also taken note of the guidelines and the timelines, both in respect of description amendments and for future Rule 1023 requests, as contained in Your Honour's decision, which was filing 460. We are currently not in a position to predict the volume of further requests that will be received, but it does appear that Rule 1023 disclosure may constitute a very significant and increasing workload over the coming months. Um, decision 460 has forecast such disclosure continuing to at least the 26th of November. And we've taken note that extensions from the existing time frame may be sought by certain of the defence teams for making further requests. While so far requests that have been received on a rolling basis, were we to receive requests for a large volume of materials at once, it is likely that we may also need to seek an extension of applicable deadlines for reviewing and processing such requests. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Mr. Kihu, please. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, we are working together, the four teams, to put lists together, so we're not going to get into duplication and putting people through unnecessary work. We don't you know, see that as advantageous to anybody. That being said, giving the proper notice goes back to my prior argument on the voluminous documents that have uh, just been disclosed. It's virtually impossible for us to assess uh, what exactly, what other information we want uh, under 1023 without digesting that information. Now we're going to have yet more documents coming on the 27th, and more importantly, we're not going to have translations until maybe the end of the year or the beginning of the year, all of which me, uh, I, I submit to Your Honor will delay the notice time for the 1023 time frame. I understand that, that the Krasniki defense has requested, Your Honor, uh, uh, to extend that time. We, are, we join in that request, and I think all counsel will join in that request. Uh, that being said, Judge, we are still going to go through or continue the 1023 requests on a rolling basis. We're not going to wait until the 11th hour. But under the current uh, regime of disclosure, 
it's virtually impossible to meet that deadline, and we uh, ask you to suspend that deadline pending further information and further information on the disclosure timetable of the prosecution. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. I invite you to uh, send your request on a ruling basis because I think it's important not to wait for the last hour for uh, the sake of the uh, disclosure process. Um, you mentioned suspend the deadline. Would you have a time in mind for which you would be uh, ready to uh, file all your requests? or Because I, I, as you may know, I don't like to uh, postpone uh, deadlines uh, up in the air forever. So will you have any idea? Do you need six more weeks, two more weeks, two more months? Well, uh, yeah, Your Honor, we, we haven't suspended it. As, as counsel uh, for the prosecution noted, we gave them a request this morning on that score. So we are going to continue to do that. My reluctance in giving you a date of six weeks, two months, uh, is tied to the translations that we haven't seen. If I tell Your Honor that we will have our 1023 notices done by November 1st, and we have yet additional information coming in these translations, I will be back before Your Honor asking for leave to extend that time frame. So in principle, Your Honor, I understand Your Honor wants a deadline on something, be it two months down the line, with the understanding that if additional information comes to us, that we will seek leave to Your Honor to extend that 1023 notice time frame. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Mr. Emerson, please. Very briefly, if I may. Uh, there, there are many different ways that prosecution uh, have delayed the process of disclosing their case, and this is one of them. Um, the Rule 1023 material is material which is in the possession of the prosecution and deemed relevant. We've been handed an index, most of which is impossible to discern the content from, which contains 68,700 entries. Now, when Mr. Kehoe says there's to be cooperation between the defense teams, what I think has been provisionally agreed between our teams is that we will divide the list of 67,000 68,700 68, <laughs> between us in order to see which ones we need further descriptions of. But to be frank, most of them need further descriptions. And I hope Your Honour will understand that as defence teams, the default position is to request everything. Because how else do we know that there isn't material within that haystack which is a vital evidence to, to the defence. And obviously we've put in requests because you can tell from some of the entries, the title, that your client's name is mentioned in it. So that straight away one can say there's a request. But we're, we're dealing with, as I say, n nearly 70,000 entries where we just don't know what the body of the evidence is. Now, we have professional obligations on this side of the barge. It's no good talking to for, 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 for the prosecutors to stand up and start talking about the defence may request extensions. This is the prosecution's job to disclose its case. And we are again in a situation where they fail to disclose the primary part of their case and, uh, 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 until the very, very last moment, and there's still an unknown quantity yet to be disclosed. And they have if you like, from the purposes of the defence, dumped on us a haystack of 70,000 separate entries, which may or may, and we have to rely on the prosecution to have been through that material. Have they even read it? I mean, I, I, I'm asking that question genuinely. It'd be interesting to know, has the prosecution read that material? In which case, why are we not being given a better description of what's in it? Do the prosecution know what's in it? I mean, I'm genuinely inviting you to put that question to the prosecution. Do they know what's in that material? And if so, why are they unable to give better descriptions in the index? Why are we having to go to them, splitting this job, which is the prosecution's job, among the four defence teams, to work out how to, which of them we have to ask them for, in order then to make the requests? As I say, there is a very real danger uh, of the practice in this tribunal normalising abnormal prosecutorial misconduct. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Young, please. Your Honour, thank 
you. I can, I can be brief. Um, I share the concerns expressed um, by Mr. Kehoe and Mr. Emerson in, entirely. And just to supplement the point that Mr. Emerson's just made in terms of what do the prosecution know about their own case or how much they're able to work on their own case and make value judgments on what should be disclosed into which category. What, what was of some concern to me with respect um, was when Ms. Lawson frankly explained to your honor that because of the pandemic, and I understand this entirely, the majority of the prosecutorial staff working remotely, unless I misheard what she said, I understood that she actually told your honor that the majority of the staff did not have access to the central database. Uh, if that, if that is correct, and I, I did not mishear what she said, uh, that would um, be a, a very um, a simple way of under, explaining and un understanding why there may be delays in terms of categorization, subcategorization, and making value judgments on what evidence falls into which category. Um, artificial intelligence is a wonderful thing, um, but it's important that individuals, humans, make decisions um, based on professional judgments. And um, if the prosecution staff don't have access to the materials, then that's another good uh, reason with respect why we're experiencing so many substantial delays. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Ms. Alleghenhauer, Mr. Ellis, please. Uh, thank you, Your Honour. I think this issue is, is, is one of mine to address. Um, you, Your Honour will have seen from our written submissions that we do request an extension uh, in which to request uh, items from the Rule 1023 notice. Uh, there are really two bases for that request. Um, the, the first is the sheer volume of material on, on the list. Um, 68,000 documents. Um, the list itself is nearly 3,000 pages long. Um, and, and the review of that list by the defence uh, coming at a time when resources were committed to the appeal process on preliminary motions uh, it, it is necessarily a time-consuming process uh, in itself. Um, but the, the second and perhaps more important point is that the assessment of materiality it is tied to our review of the disclosure that we receive from the prosecution. Um, to, to take an obvious example, um, if a document is described in the notice by reference to the name of a particular individual, we may not know at the current time whether that individual is material to our investigation or not. Um, it's only after we've had the opportunity to go through the disclosure that we've been given uh, and to see whether there is information re relevant to that individual in the disclosure uh, that we can make an assessment of materiality. Um, and that's why in my submission, counsel for Mr. Thatchy was, was right to, to initially seek a suspension uh, of this timeline. Um, because the problem is, from my point of view, uh, I'm not going to be in a position to give a final decision on whether these documents are material or not uh, until the prosecution has completed its disclosure. Um, and, and by that, I mean until we've received the translations uh, of all the 1021B material. Um, so to even begin to talk about our, our, our final deadline until that point uh, would, in my submission, be wrong in principle. Um, and being entirely upfront with the court, given the volume of material that's been disclosed uh, and the volume of material on the list, uh, it's going to be months after we receive those translations uh, rather than days. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Before I give the floor to the prosecution, I'd like to hear the defense teams on the deadline that I set in my recent decision, F460, on the defense request on the, the notice. If the deadline of the 24 September, if my memory is correct, to ask the SPO to supplement its notice uh, is a deadline that seems feasible, or if you also request an extension of this deadline, because in the decision, uh, if all the, the, the teams uh, remember, I set two different regime, one for which you consider that you have enough information in the notice currently, and one for the uh, entries for which you consider that you're not briefed enough and you need more. And I set the deadline of the 20, of 24 September for the defense team to 
ask the SPO to supplement the notice. And all the defense team are spoken about the deadline to request the documents themselves, but to go back to the SPO to supplement the notice. Is the uh, date of the 24th September feasible, or do you also request an extension of this deadline? Mr. Kiwi. Yes, my apologies, Judge, but uh, I, I was including both of those issues together, and uh, uh, but I do, on behalf of Mr. Thatchi, we do request a, a, an extension of the deadline to supplement the, the disclosure. As Mr. Emerson rightly pointed out, we're talking about an enormous amount of material, uh, and heaven knows we're not looking to review more information than we have to. So we would like to an extension on both deadlines. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe. Mr. Emerson? Yes, uh, when I said the defence were cooperating amongst themselves, in, that was in relation to determining whether which parts of the, the 67,000 entries needed further, um, needed for, we tried to break that down um, on the basis that um, uh, there is at least sufficient common interest for us to be able to determine whether the description of a document is sufficient to understand its contents. But you can be certain sure of this, that insofar as it has been, the defence have already made the requests. So we've made our requests for documents relating to Mr. Vissi. I gather the other teams have, have done the same. So everything else at the moment requires further uh, analysis. And we're basically being asked to do the prosecution's job for them. You're, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm uncomfortable about it being put on the basis of the defence seeking an extension of a deadline because a decent prosecution wouldn't come before this court with a 68,000 pound, uh, 68,000 entry uh, document which was largely subject to these few entries mentioning people's names, impenetrable and meaningless, and say, here you are, it's for the defence to show why, why they should have each of these documents when we can't even see what they say. We're, we're being asked to do the prosecution's job for them. And as I said right at the beginning of these proceedings, I, I wasn't, in, if you remember, when even you were asking to set a, a schedule for the form in which it was, I said, I'm not doing that because that's the prosecution's job. The prosecution's job is to be fit for trial. And whatever you can say about this prosecution, wherever they started off, the wheels have come off and it needs to be dealt with urgently. Mr. Young, briefly on these uh, two, uh, two concurrent deadlines. Nothing to add. I support what Mr. Kehoe and Mr. Emerson have said. Thank you, Mr. Young. Mr. Ellis, please. Yes, yeah, so I don't think there's anything to add, Your Honour. Uh, we join with the earlier submissions. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Madam Prosecutor. Um, we are obviously aware that there is a significant volume of materials listed on the notice. Um, that's the nature of the case, the scope of the case, the geographic and temporal parameters. Um, and we have no comments on uh, what the defence have indicated. One clarification, perhaps. I, I did not say that staff did not review the materials. What I said was that they did not have access to the centralised database what that means is we had to find workarounds to enable the review, review by people, not by machinery, to take place, and that this was logistically challenging and did increase the time required. Thank you. Um, what, what, one Thank you, one Ms, very small Mr. Emerson, please, I um, give the floor, so if you wish floor, to yes. ask the floor, you get back to me. You don't directly address the prosecution. No, I wasn't. I was, a I was standing up to address you, <laughs> to invite you to give me the floor for what is a very, very short point. Then you have the floor for a very short point. Yes, so, so just addressing the, the debate between Mr. Mr. Young and uh, 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 the prosecution, the, the, the precise form of words used was that for the prosecution conducting a large-scale review with staff working remotely, it was an enormously logistically challenging task. All of that was said at the first hearing by the defence about the way these proceedings were going to take place. All of that was entirely predictable, but the prosecution chose when to indict. They made the decision to indict these men and have them remanded in custody, in other words, to seek their arrest and detention, 
at a time when they were years away from being ready. All, all of the, 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 the excuses, and they are, they are frankly, I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary to hear the prosecution stand up and try and excuse its conduct on the basis of the coronavirus pandemic, when right at the very beginning, all of that was totally obvious, all of that was said in open court, and you were promised this prosecution would be trial ready by now. I, I still don't understand why you haven't asked the prosecution to explain or apologise that, for that. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Madam Prosecutor, do you want to respond? No, thank you, Your Honour. I don't think I have anything to add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let us now move uh, briefly, I hope, to the last two items in the disclosure agenda. Uh, the Rule 1023 material. I would like to know whether there remains any exculpatory evidence in the SPO's custody, control or actual knowledge that must be disclosed to the defence, pursuant to Rule 103, and whether any request for protective measures of such material is imminent. Madam Prosecutor. Since the last status conference, five packages of potentially exculpatory items have been disclosed, including most recently disclosure package 83. Re remaining materials are being worked through. The review is ongoing, and we will continue to disclose the materials on a rolling basis as soon as it is identified. And there are no protective measures requests imminent in respect of such material. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Mr. Kihu, please. Yes, Your Honor, this is, this is an issue that uh, I have been looking at given the, sub, the disclosures, and I am not going to stand before Your Honor and attest that I have gone through the voluminous disclosures that we have just received. However, I was interested in uh, much of the cable traffic coming from internationals, and frankly, there were not that many, for lack of a better term. And that was surprising given the amount of time my client spent with internationals in various fora throughout Europe and elsewhere, that there is very few cables concerning where he was and what he was doing. And my concern is that these aren't being disclosed because they're not helpful to the prosecution and they look at them benignly as opposed to something that could certainly mitigate any guilt of our client, or more importantly, affect the credibility of an international witness. For instance, if a diplomat for the United States who happened to be in the theater or in NATO or in some other locale, and I use the United States just as an example, it could be a, a, a diplomat from any country, and he or she is going to testify about a certain issue, and there are in fact cables, there are in fact reports that undercut what that witness has to say or tell a different story, that is also 103 material. It's not only just exculpatory material or mitigation material, it's information that affects the credibility of a, prosecu a, of a prosecution witness. And my concern with these lack of cables is this. I see various internationals on the witness list, but I see very few cables coming from their respective countries, which could fall into a variety of categories and certainly, certainly affect the credibility of that particular witness. Again, this is extremely important to Mr. Thatchi because Mr. Thatchi was doing a lot of work on an international level with international leaders. So, we go through a, a, a request, and this can be pursuant to a, 10, a, a, a 107 request because if, it could be that these can't be disclosed without permission of the providing uh, country, that that request be made. And that request be made that we look at everything that the prosecution has looked at. That would be the easiest way to do this. So if cable traffic coming from France, whatever it happens to be, whether they're going to use it or not, it be disclosed to us to discern whether or not it undercuts the credibility of somebody or whether or not it is in support of the position taken by Mr. Thatcher at trial. 
I raise this, Your Honor, simply because with this lack of cable traffic from various countries, I am not certain that the prosecution has not expanded their Rule 103 focus to encompass an analysis to whether documentation, not only that they have control over, but that they have knowledge of, of whether that information affects the credibility of their witnesses. And I make that request, Your Honor, to ask the prosecution to give us the disclosure of all of that information, the cable traffic from every country, and if there has to be permission received under uh, Rule 107, and I understand that, that, that uh, you know, Rule 103 is subject to Rule 107 and 108, that that request be made. Thank you, Mr. Kiyo. Just one follow-up question. If I understand correctly, you invite the prosecution to have a proactive uh, conception of exculpatory material, i.e. not only what they have in their uh, possession or control, but to investigate or to request uh, documents from international organizations or states in order to assess if there could be exculpatory material in these documents. Am I correct? That would be ideal, but I, if, if what preliminarily, Your Honor, is is there a, a raft of material? Are there, is information be, been received by the prosecution? And they have selected document one, two, and three, and not four, five, and six, because they're not going to use it in their case. So your, your request is twofold. Is first, uh, the uh, conception of exculpatory in the documents that are currently in possession of the SPO that they have a very broad conception of Rule 103, and second, that they have a proactive conception of 103, if I may call it that way. Except, and, and just so, just as an officer of the court, I, I, I would take you, Your Honor back to it and not extend it too far on our, our port. If they know about it, that the rule says it, it quite clearly it's in their custody, control, or knowledge. So if it's in their custody and control, that's the easy part, but let's take for instance, there is a trip to the Quai de Osse, and they look through a variety of documents, and they read some and leave some there. If, in fact, the ones they decided not to take were potentially impeaching of one of their witnesses, certainly that is something within their knowledge that we're entitled to under Rule 103, subject, of course, to Rule 107. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Thank you. Mr. Emerson, please. So, so j just to be clear, there's a, there, we're obviously dealing with these items of the agenda separately, but there's inevitably a potential overlap between Rule 103 and Rule 1023 material. And I, I, if you remember, I, I, I invited the prosecution to indicate, have they read the 68,000 entries? Do they actually know what's in there? If they don't, if the answer to that is those documents have not been humanly read, then the prosecution cannot have performed its obligations in relation to exculpatory material. Now, without going into detail, I know that there is material in that list that is exculpatory and should be in their list of exculpatory material. So they clearly haven't got to grips with what's in it. And, and, and so I, I, I must insist again that the prosecution be asked to indicate formally in court the extent to which that 68,700 68, page index, the documents underlying it have been humanly read and analysed for relevance. And if we, we need an answer to that today. They know the answer. They should tell you. Because if the answer is no, then we're in real trouble in terms of this trial. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Young, please. Your Honor, yes, very briefly. It's really on the same point. As Your Honor knows, the prosecutor has just told you that the prosecution are reviewing the Rule 103 or potentially exculpatory material, that the review remains ongoing. Um, as Your Honor knows, this is a, a very important category of material because it goes to the potential innocence of the accused or to the undermining of the prosecution witnesses. So as a category, it doesn't get more important with respect than that. So for that reason, and building on the point that Mr. Emerson's made, in my respectful submission, it's very important 
that you honour and the parties, and particularly the defence and the accused, have an idea of the volume of um, material that the prosecution have identified as material they need to review to consider whether it falls within 103. This will be directly relevant to the, the proceedings. And, uh, and so I support what Mr. Emerson says. We, we need to have an idea. Are we talking about one or two documents? Are we talking about thousands or, te or tens of thousands? They've clearly identified a body of material they still need to review. And, and so an answer to that would be useful. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Mr. Ellis or Ms. Alagandra? Uh, Ms. Alagandra, microphone, please. I, I... Sorry, Mr. Ellis will address the court, Your Honor. I apologize. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, but you were a lot on Zoom today, so I see you in very little uh, images, so it's sometimes uh, harder for me to, uh, to uh, have an idea of who will uh, take the floor. Mr. Ellis, please. Uh, Your Honour, it was not worth waiting for me. I, I, I simply join with what's been said before <laughs> by other defence teams. <laughs> it is always worse, Mr. Ellis. Um, let me turn to, to the prosecution. I think there are several questions that have been asked by the defense. Uh, the first one is, I think, the uh, conception of the prosecution of what is actual knowledge in Rule 103. Uh, I think the second question is, uh, has the review of the 103 material been made so as to make sure that there is no uh, Rule 1023 material in the list that should have been disclosed separately. And then the third question is about the volume of the uh, 1023 material. I'm sorry, before, before uh, Ms. Lawson answers that question, the, the question I asked you to ask, and I don't know whether you deliberately put it in a different way or not, but the question I asked you to ask very specifically is, has the prosecution read that each of the documents in the 103 list in other words, has a human mind been brought to bear on those 68,700 entries to determine whether or not they contain 103 material? I heard you, Mr. Emerson. Uh, Ms. Lawson, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Honour. In relation to the Tachi defence indication of cables being of particular interest to them, that is something that we have taken note of. I believe that a number of cables have been disclosed and there are others which are listed on the Rule 1023 notice. Um, if, if the Tachi defence intends to make a Rule 1023 application in respect of cables or considers itself to have done so now we can we can discuss after the hearing um, the mat with respect to the um, Vaselli defense query the materials on the rule 1023 notice have indeed been humanly reviewed and assessed for their relevance um, identification of exculpatory review is though a more in-depth review exercise and it is ongoing. We, the defence teams are correct that there may well be Rule 1023 information among the items that are listed on the Rule 1023 list. And that is because that review is ongoing. We have never, complained, uh, never claimed it to be complete. Um, however, in a case of this nature, we would anticipate that a significant amount of Rule 1023 disclosure would relate to similar potentially exculpatory issues um, to material which has already been disclosed as Rule 1023. Now, we're not in any um, way suggesting that that makes it um, less of an obligation for us to disclose that material. We are reviewing and will disclose it, but just to note that it may well not be significantly new exculpatory issues that are arising. And in addition, as the um, Tachi defence team themselves mentioned, certain items are, of course, only exculpatory relevant 
relative to the witnesses and evidence that's being relied upon. So that is a review that we will need to continue and we're aware that we need to continue it as we finalise our witness and exhibit lists. Um, I believe that addresses the questions. If there is something that I have missed, I'm happy to... There was a it. volume of the uh, 1023 material, if you can add any detail on this. Um, I don't have that number um, in front of me. I know that there is, a, there is a category of material that has been identified as requiring Rule 1023 review, and I know that there is more recently received material which has not yet undergone review. Um, those are the two categories, but I don't have the um, number, the volume with me. And, and I correct myself for the transcript. I said the volume of 1023, it, it was in fact the volume of Rule 103 material. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Emerson, please. Uh, the fact is Ms. Lawson can't conceivably answer that question because, as she's just told you, there has been no effective review uh, of the 68,700 documents on the 103 list for exculpatory material. Nonetheless, she reassures you that it's m likely to be the same as other exculpatory material. How on earth does she know that when there's been no review? What, on what factual basis does Council make that submission to you when the review hasn't yet occurred? This is what I mean about prosecutorial misrepresentation. That, that there is 68,700 documents which she acknowledges may well contain Rule 103 material, but she has no idea what it is. And can we just note what that means? I mean, it means the whole discussion we've been having in the last hour has been a complete waste of time because there is a volume of material which may contain significantly exculpatory uh, 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 material which hasn't even been looked at for that purpose. So, yes, there's been some human involvement, whatever that means, but not enough to give it a proper description in the index. But more fundamentally than that, you've just heard it admitted cold as day that the review for exculpatory material has not been done. In other words, that, as, as Ms Lawson has just said in absolutely clear terms, yes, there may well be exculpatory material in that 70,000 uh, uh, document list. Now, if that is the position, then how are we, how are we to pay, pay any, place any reliance on the closure of the prosecution case? I mean, the, 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 we are the defence being asked to go through that material when the prosecution themselves haven't even done it. And it's being, the burden is being cast upon us. Something's gone very seriously wrong here. This is why I say... You have to listen very carefully to what Miss Lawson says. She doesn't like me personalising it. She likes me to use um, language which is polite. She doesn't like the word prosecutorial misconduct. But for counsel to stand up and say to you, it may well be the same as stuff we've already disclosed when it hasn't yet been analysed. Clearly, there was no factual basis for that submission. That is, in my, in my, in, in my experience and in the jurisdictions I come from, that is prosecutorial misconduct. Mr. Kihui, if I may briefly, briefly please. Just very briefly. We, uh, the Rule 103 uh, uh, item that I brought up, it, it, Rule 103 stands on its own, Your Honor, as, as you know. It has to do with you know, mitigation, has to do with guilt. And that, yes, there is a portion of it that has to do with impeaching of witnesses. But independent of the witnesses that they put on and independent of, of the documents that they rely on, there is a standalone obligation to disclose exculpatory material under the rule. Yes, it is supplemented and explained in these other ways, but there is a standalone obligation. My idea, my, my, my submission on the cables is not that cables haven't been given to us, but there is not nearly enough. For those of us who have lived in that world and recognize the amount of cables that go back and forth when significant meetings that my client attended, uh, attended have a, a significant dearth of cable traffic, it indicates to me that there is, there is more cable traffic out there that either hasn't been disclosed or the, the prosecution doesn't think, you know, it, it hasn't helped their case and they don't see it as 103 material. 
It is that material that we want to see and ask for if they need to get 107 uh, permission. I ask that the court order them to do so. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Madam Prosecutor, do you want to reply? And if so, briefly. Thank you. Yes, very briefly. To be clear, I did not say that 68,000 items have not been reviewed. There is a subset of that data which has not been reviewed fully for exculpatory material yet, and that review is ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Uh, let me turn to the interpreters. Do you allow me, do you allow us five minutes to finish the topic of disclosure before the break? Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate because that way we're going to finish the uh, disclosure item in the agenda. Uh, let us move to the last category, the Rule 107 material. I would like to know whether the parties are facing or foresee any difficulties related to the disclosure process with respect to Rule 107 material and whether any application person to, person to this rule is imminent. I know we've already touched upon that uh, category when we went through uh, the other categories, but is there anything to add in relation to the the Rule 107 material. Madam Prosecutor. Your Honour, I don't have much to add to the written submissions. Um, mm. Discussions with certain relevant organisations are ongoing in respect of clearances or counterbalancing measures. The organisations have been and are continuously being kept apprised of the urgency and importance of the matter and the remaining clearances are being actively worked on. It is a process where in many cases we are discussing individual documents on an almost line by line basis with the providers and we're doing that to ensure that any restrictions or redactions which they consider necessary are kept to an absolute minimum and to the maximum extent possible that any such um, restrictions do not relate to information that would be material to defence preparations. As Your Honour is aware, we have made a number of Rule 107 applications to date, and we do anticipate that further applications may be forthcoming. As indicated in our filing, they could arise in, a connection, in connection with a number of matters, including in the context of Rule 1023 requests to access material. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Uh, Mr. Kehu, please. Yes, Your Honor, this is a bit of a dark hole for us, the one the, the, on, under these submissions, uh, you know, under uh, Rule 107. We're not exactly what is being contemplated by the prosecution. So uh, without further information, I, I, I beg Your Honor's indulgence. I just don't have much to say. Thank you, Mr. Kehu. Mr. Emerson, please. Likewise. Mr. Young. Nothing to add, thank you. Mr. Legendra? Nothing to add from us either, Your Honour. Sorry, Mr. Ellis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Uh, it is 4.07 uh, Hague time. We're going to have a break for 30 minutes, so we will be back at 4.37 for the remaining items in the agenda of our status conference today. The hearing is adjourned. All rise.
All right. Let us now move to the second issue in our agenda after disclosure, which is the issue of translations of filings and evidentiary material. I would first like to hear from the registry on the progress made with regard to the translation of these items, notably whether the language service unit has an estimate for the translation of the decisions on preliminary motions, and whether, whether the parties have made any further urgent requests for translation. In addition, I note the submission from the Krasniki defense recalling that out of 684 filing items available in English, only 114 are available in Albanian and that the backlog continues to grow. Mr. President, I believe you're on mute. No, I don't think I'm on mute. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, uh, apparently, uh, I think there is a problem. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. So from from what I understand, I was muted in Zoom, but I wasn't muted in the courtroom. <laughs> so I don't control Zoom. Zoom is controlled by the uh, audiovisual. Uh, uh, booth here. So, uh, did you hear anything I said or did it stop at some point? I just heard when you said, can you hear me now? Okay, so I will start from scratch so that you can uh, uh, go back to, you can, we can, uh, you will not miss anything. So I said that we will now move to the issue of translation of filings and evidentiary material. So I said that I would like to hear from the registry first of the progress made with regard to the translation of uh, specific items, notably if the language service unit has an estimate for the translation of the decisions on preliminary motions, and whether the parties have made any further urgent requests for translation. In addition, I note the submissions from the Krasniki defense, recalling that out of 684 filings item, filing items available in English, only 114 are available in Albanian and that the backlog continues to grow. I would therefore also like to hear the parties on any further difficulties regarding translations and if there are filings that need to be prioritized. Mr. Ross, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Your Honour. Uh, first, concerning the three decisions on uh, preliminary motions, that's F00412, 413 and 450. The current uh, best estimate from Language Services Unit is that these will all be completed no later than the 15th of October, and that's subject to any supervening uh, urgent requirements which may set that deadline back, but 15th October is the current best estimate. Um, as regards other priority requests, there are no outstanding priority requests. We, uh, Court Management Unit, contacted all the defence teams on the 8th of September, asking them to submit any requests, and as of now, we have not received any requests to date. So, um, more generally, I mean, all of the documents that are required under the RPE and the law to be translated are already translated, um, and obviously we are progressing through all of the filings um, as expeditiously as possible. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Let me give the floor to the defence. Mr. Kihu, please. Yes, Your Honour. I think uh, the uh, Krasniki submission has outlined where we are here, Judge. Uh, obviously, that uh, with, with uh, 684 uh, items in English, only 114 translated, uh, makes it impossible for our clients and Mr. Thachi for, for, to review these items. Uh, and it goes back to what I noted with Your Honor uh, before on, under the, the, uh, the notice disclosure on the 1023. So uh, they're all wrapped up in the same item that it's difficult to give a 103 notice without having that discussion with our client with those documents in Albania. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Mr. Emerson, please. Nothing to add at this stage. 
Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Young, please. Yes, uh, Your Honour, the, the situation is this. In terms of priority requests, as I mentioned at the last status conference, there will be clearly a number of requests for um, translation of priority materials. But at this stage, um, where we are unclear about the relevance of a, a large amount of the materials, it would not be proper to put the requests in. Um, but I can say it's highly likely that there will be a number of prior priority requests and that so that hopefully there will be the resources in due course uh, to deal with the translation requirements. Thank you, Mr. Young. Mr. Legendra or Mr. Ellis? Um, you, Your Honour, very briefly on, on this point, um, in relation to the preliminary motions, um, if the translation of those is received on the 15th of October, which, which I think is a Friday, um, the current deadline for replies uh, on jurisdiction issues is, is, is the 18th of October, um, which is the Monday. <clears throat> so if it's at all possible for those to be received earlier, it would be beneficial and might allow Mr. Krasnici to participate in, in, in the appeal process. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Do I take from your submissions that you would uh, like the registry to prioritize the decision on jurisdiction so that this one is is uh, distributed, the translation is distributed uh, before the others, if needed? Uh, that, that, that would be sensible, Your Honour, yes. Uh, and, and on other matters, we, we've received the registry's email and we, we'll engage with them on, on those matters. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Mr. Roche, does this seem to be feasible for uh, the language service section to prioritize the uh, jurisdictional decision, the decision on jurisdiction? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I will um, expedite that with language services unit. Um, so filing F00412 out of the three will be given additional priority. I, and if we have a, a more specific date in advance of the 15th of October, we will communicate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rush. This is much appreciated. Uh, does the SPO have anything to add on the issue of translation? No. Um, let me just give the floor to Mr. Laws on uh, the question of translation. Do you have anything you would like to add? Well, no, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Laws. I now turn back to the SPO to ask about the status of its ongoing investigations, in particular, whether the SPO can provide a further update on the estimate date of completion for outstanding investigative steps, whether the SPO is prepared to commit to a date for filing its pre-trial brief and related material person to Rule 95. I note that the SPO did not mention anything in that regard in its written submissions. And in light of the Thatchy defense request discussed during the last status conference, whether the filing of a preliminary witness list ahead of the deadline set forth in Rule 94, 95.4b of the rules is feasible, and if so, when. I also invite the SPO to make any submissions on the procedural calendar in this case. Madam Prosecutor. Thank you, Your Honour. With respect to ongoing investigative steps, I do not have much to add to the submissions made at the last status conference. It remains the case that it is the responsibility of the office to continue to investigate within its mandate. We are aware of the applicable framework and we are, are aware that should further investigations result in material which we seek to rely upon, judicial authorization may be required. Any such application would be considered at the relevant time with regard to the nature of the material in question, the timing, and other considerations going to relevance and potential prejudice. With respect to Rule 95.4 materials, we had indicated at the last status conference that there were a number of variables which could impact timing depending on how resource intensive they proved to be. That included in particular litigation on preliminary motions and rule 1023 disclosure and related litigation. There has been some, but by no means full, um, further clarity on those matters. For example, the preliminary motions litigation 
is continuing to be very intensive. All parties have had to seek certain extensions of deadline in order to address it, both at the appellate level and before Your Honour. There are currently seven motions encompassing 81 issues and grounds of appeal, which the SPO is in the course of responding to, and further motions on constitutional issues are expected at the end of this week. We don't yet know how extensive those will be, but I think it's safe to say that the litigation is likely to continue on preliminary motions with a degree of intensity for some time. Additionally, as I already mentioned today, um, we do not have clarity on the remaining volume of the Rule 1023 disclosure uh, requests and review that will be required. However, including based on the submissions made today, there's every reason to anticipate that that may occupy, uh, well, that disclosure in one form or another may occupy a majority of our resources indeed those of each of the parties through October and November at least. In summary, these are very intensive work streams which are forecast to continue, perhaps even more intensively than they have been over at least the next couple of months. And as a result, while we can confirm that we will not be in a position to provide the Rule 95-4 materials in October, we are unfortunately not in a position to commit with certainty to a concrete date. We are, of course, continuing to work internally to the best of our abilities to simultaneously progress each of the work streams that need to progress, and that does include work on the Rule 95.4 materials, and we'll continue to keep the court apprised in that regard. It is as much in our interests as in anyone else's that these materials are provided at the earliest opportunity um, upon which it is possible to provide them. With respect to provision of a preliminary witness list, on the 6th of August, the SPO informed the defence teams of the names of three individuals whose statements or prior testimony had been relied upon in the indictment supporting materials, but whom the SPO no longer intends to call as witnesses. It remains the position that the SPO currently intends to rely upon the evidence of all other witnesses whose material has been or is being disclosed. And subject to the outstanding clearance or variation matters, which I mentioned earlier, this is anticipated to be approximately 320 individuals. As indicated at the last status conferences, status conference, the witnesses and their materials is available to the defence. However, should the court consider it necessary, we would be in a position to provide a preliminary list in advance of the Rule 95-4B requirements. It must be stressed that that list would indeed be preliminary and subject to change. However, we believe we could provide such a list in the upcoming weeks that is, we anticipate we could provide it by the 22nd of October. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Mr. Kihu, please. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, it, at the outset, uh, it is quite disturbing that, that we have heard from the prosecution that their investigation is ongoing. I believe the word was used to describe it with uh, no date in sight as to when that would end. So we are forced to guess as to when this entire matter would be complete and we have the body of evidence that we need to address in the courtroom. Kosovo laws, you know, Your Honor, requires that the investigation be complete before the case is actually indicted. That has not ha happened in this case. Not only has it not happened, my client and the other accused have been in custody since last November for an investigation that was supposed to be completed and here we stand before Your Honor on the 14th of September, and there's still no date in sight for the end of this investigation. Uh, I think that it, uh, it behooves the prosecution to give the court and the defense some idea of when will there be an end. When will this end so we all know what we need to address? And nothing that was just advanced by my learned friend across the well has given us any indication as to when that's going to end. 
and for us to have a, a trial that is not only fair but expeditious, there has to be some end to this investigative matter such that it is turned over to the defense. This is what we have and this is what we're going to address. And that does not look like it's anywhere in sight, certainly not in the near future. Now, we certainly appreciate a list, any list, of, of witnesses that the defense, that the prosecution is going to call. Clearly, at this juncture, the prosecution has made a decision that a certain set of witnesses are going to be called viva voce. And in defense of, of, of uh, uh, the prosecution, they did, in fact, inform us of four individuals who they do not intend to call. And we appreciate that. But with regard to the first segment on this preliminary list, we would hope that those are the witnesses that the, government, that the prosecution has, in fact, made a decision that it would call, and we welcome that. But again, at the risk of reiterating this, Judge, this has been going on for a real long, a very long time, and we still not have no idea, no concrete date as to when this investigation uh, will end. And we will ask the court to put that question to the prosecution as to when this investigation is going to end. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Mr. Emerson, please. Yeah. Um, obviously, I adopt uh, the position taken by Mr. Kehoe, but uh, I want, if I may, specifically to focus on item num um, B in your list. Uh, and first of all, um, and it may be a translation issue, but, but, but it's put as whether the prosecution is prepared to commit to a date for this filing of its pretrial brief, which, with respect, is the tail wagging the dog. It's not for the judge to ask the prosecution if they're prepared to commit. It's for the judge to order the prosecution when they must do things and to be inviting the prosecution to set its own deadline when we know, we know, that nothing the prosecution says about its deadlines has the slightest shred of remaining credibility is, with respect, entirely the wrong approach. You should be ordering a deadline. On the fifth status conference, on the 19th of May, that's what judicial muscularity means, the prosecution told you it would have its pretrial brief ready by mid-October. Now, that was, we were already a year in, given that the prosecution started by telling you that this trial would begin in June of this year. So already we were way past that. But, but, but in the, in, in, at the fifth status conference on the 19th of May, they said the pre-trial brief would be ready by mid-October. And at the last status conference, they said there had been no change to that estimate. That is what you should order. You should order it today. The 31st of October is the date for the pre-trial -pre brief. It's what they've been promising. Otherwise, literally, the tail is wagging the dog. The judge is effectively inviting the prosecution to set its own timetable, its own procedure, and when it breaks its own promises or even breaks the orders of the court, just ignoring it and letting them go along. I mean, that's a very strange way to find a question being posed in, a, in an agenda which the judge is setting a timetable and actively managing a case. You know, we all know, the prosecution is out of control. It had every opportunity. It was entirely predictable. They even knew about the jurisdictional litigation at the time when they gave you a promised last status conference. They would be ready by mid-October. You must understand, I don't know if you're, you're, you're a practicing history, but if you've ever practiced in, in either side of the bar, you must understand that we need to know the case we have to meet before we can commence on an investigation of that case. So given the chaos, the absolute utter chaos, and the constant misrepresentation, I'm not going to call it lies because presumably circumstances have changed, but utter lack of foresight giving you excuses that we told you were predictable at the time, and then leaving for you to then leave it to the prosecution to decide when they'd like to file their pretrial brief. That's not case management with greatest of respect. The, the prosecution should be required and ordered to file their pretrial brief 
at the latest on the 31st of October, then we can start making some progress with the defence investigations. It's not about a list, I mean, it's helpful to have a list of possible witnesses. We want to know exactly how the prosecution puts its case. We will, by the 31st of October, be one year... No, sorry, uh, let me just get the dates correct. We're, we're, we'll, be, we'll be very close to one year in custody. And I, I, is your honour really going to sit there and say it's for the prosecution to decide whether these men, after a year in prison, presumed innocent, are entitled to know the case they have to meet? The order should be made. It's a judicial responsibility to make it. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Young, please. Your Honour, thank you. Very briefly, Your, Your Honour may remember, I think it was the first or the second status conference that we had when um, I, uh, I sought to use a, a French expression, which was guillotine. And uh, we had an interesting legal discussion about whether there should be a guillotine on the prosecution in terms of stopping a, 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 a fixed hard stop deadline for the end of investigations, the end of disclosure by the prosecution, to give the defence a chance to consider what's been, uh, uh, um, been disclosed, to have an overview and to have some breathing space um, to move on from there. So we, we, there was never a, a day to impose for some form of guillotine, but I think as Mr. Emerson said, the time has come. Uh, and to use another French expression, if I may, the reality is that this prosecution cannot be allowed to have carte blanche over the way they choose to prosecute and manage this case. So I do respectfully ask your honour to make a decision and to um, take a judicial decision on the timeline. It cannot be for the prosecution to, to exercise some form of carte blanche. And with respect, I do ask for um, a case management on this as it's directly relevant to the fairness of the proceedings. Thank you, Mr. Young. Ms. Alagendra or Mr. Ellis? Uh, Your Honour, we do join in the earlier submissions that have been made. Um, on a practical matter, we, we do also say that the, the provision of a preliminary witness list, um, understanding that it would be a preliminary list, um, would be not just useful, but, but, but essential to the defence uh, preparation uh, on, on what is still a large number of documents um, given to the defence with very little by way of navigational aid. Um, so we, we would see uh, a preliminary witness list at, at an early stage, as early a stage as possible, um, and for that to be accompanied with witness packages, um, linking documents to witnesses. Uh, you're, you're, Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Honor, Mr. Kiwi, just, just very one, briefly then. Very briefly, and, and I, I neglected to bring this out because it, it ties into this subject as well as the next. Uh, and a date for the, the unredacted indictment. Uh, Your Honor has asked issues on, on, on alibi, et cetera. We, we still don't have a completely unredacted indictment, not only for just the defense. So is there a date in the very near future when the defense is going to get a, a completely unredacted indictment? It could be under seal. A variety of measures can be taken. But in order for us to conduct, what, at least preliminarily, we have to, have to know what these redactions are in this indictment because they go to time, they go to place, they go to a variety of other things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kiwi. Madam Prosecutor, uh, first of all, I welcome your proposal to uh, prepare a preliminary witness list by the deadline that you uh, proposed. So I take note that this is something that you're gonna work in Terpartes and is going to be prepared in the following weeks. Uh, on the other issues raised by the defense teams, uh, notably the issue of the end of the investigations uh, raised by several defense teams and the uh, guillotine and also on the pretrial brief and the request by Mr. Emerson that a deadline be ordered according to your earlier estimates. You have the floor. Thank you, Your Honour. We have taken note and we will um, indeed provide such a list by the timeline that I indicated. In 
um, respect of ongoing investigations, I did address that matter at the last status conference um, at a degree of length. I don't believe I need to repeat the submissions, but further investigations will encompass other cases and investigations being conducted by the office, as well as following up leads in this case. And it is the responsibility of the office to do so. With regard to um, the pretrial brief, the Vaselli defense mischaracterizes the submission made at the last status conference. The SPO certainly did not promise any date at that point. Um, there were, an, as I mentioned already in my submissions today, there were a number of um, uh, factors that I mentioned that would impact that timing potentially significantly depending on the how in resource intensive they proved to be. And I have explained further today, and all of the parties are aware of how resource intensive each of the two matters that I mentioned are. Um, they are resource intensive for everyone, not just the prosecution. Estimates are obviously provided at any particular time in light of the circumstances existing at that time and the available information. And it is certainly not the case that the prosecution is dictating timelines in this case. The pretrial judge has established um, a, a pretrial calendar, including in respect of disclosure. And what the prosecution is doing is endeavoring to keep the court apprised of what are realistic time frames in the circumstances as they prevail. It is really not of benefit, I think, to anyone for um, an unrealistic deadline to be set. As I indicated, we are continuing to advance that work stream as expeditiously as we can do. And it is in our interest, of course, that we provide the materials as soon as they can possibly be provided. I think I was clear that October is not a realistic date for us. Um, in the present circumstances. Thank you. Madam Prosecutor, I have to recall that uh, you talk about an unrealistic deadline, but the deadlines have been proposed by your office. They have been proposed by your office in November last year, and then they have been proposed in several status conferences. So I understand you, and this is why I always hear the parties before setting deadlines, because I think it's important to, for that every party around here is able to do its job so that we have robust adversarial proceedings. That said, it is also important that all the parties give realistic deadlines throughout the proceedings, and here, I rely on the deadlines, or at least the proposals that the SPO made in the previous months. So I understand your point. I don't want to set unrealistic deadlines, but here I also have to be consistent with the calendar that I've set and with the estimates of each party. So I understand that today you in a difficult position to propose a deadline, but in any case, I will have to set this deadline, and I will have to set this deadline in the following weeks. We cannot wait any longer for the SP to pretrial brief. I think the defense is right in saying that at some point the case has to be clear for them. We are reaching uh, the one year uh, anniversary or mark after the beginning of these proceedings before these adversarial proceedings in the pretrial phase. So I think we will have to move on, and I will have to set a time for the pretrial brief at the latest in the next status conference. <laughs> Madam Prosecutor. Your Honor, that is well understood. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. May I, may I just respond? Mr. Emerson, very, very, very briefly, please. I, I, will, I will be brief, um, if I may. But um, you, 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 just to be absolutely clear, at the last the status conference, um, uh, uh, we were told that the pretrial brief would be ready by mid-October. Nothing has happened since then to justify an extension. By then, the prosecution had already received the constitutional challenge material. By then, the prosecution knew what material was in its possession for the purposes of disclosure. 
So with, with the greatest of respect, it's not enough to say to the, to, to the, we'll be fixing a date at the next status conference. The next status conference will be beyond the appropriate date. The appropriate date, absolutely outside, is the 31st of October. Mr. Emerson, you heard me. I've heard that you're going to set a date. So I told the prosecution that I was going to set a date at the latest in the next status conference. At the latest. So there is no need... Well, can, we, can, 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 we, can we then, at the, at the same time, link the next status conference? I mean, what, what the, the point I'm trying to make here is at, at the last... I, I hear you, but we're not going to rediscuss my previous decisions. We're not going like, to rediscuss points that you already present no, your submissions. No, I, I'm making a different point, right, which is that on the 21st of July the last status conference, the prosecution said it would be ready by mid-October. I'm concerned only at this stage with the pre-trial brief. There must therefore be a draft pre-trial brief. It must be, that promise could not have been made to you on the 21st of July. But I'm not interested to see a draft. I want no, to see a exactly, final exactly, pre-trial brief exactly. that is... Uh, uh, finalized in it, order for the defense team to do a proper job. Ex exactly, and there's plenty of time between now and the end of October for it to be finalized and served, is the point I was making. <coughs> exactly. Any defense wants to request the floor? No, I don't see any. Just Mr. Very briefly, Mr. Kihu, then. Again, uh, counsel didn't raise, uh, counsel for the prosecution didn't raise disclosure of an unredacted indictment. Is, is that uh, uh, possible to do in the next few days? Mm, Madam Prosecutor, on this question. Your Honor, it's not possible to do within the next few days. Um, we are, as certain of the redactions in it are related to protective measures which have been um, ordered. But we do keep it under constant review and um, lift redactions when they can be lifted, indeed, in the um, version of the indictment which was filed on the 3rd of September, certain additional redactions had been lifted. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Let us now move to the next topic in our agenda related to detention. I would like the registry to give an update on the detention regime, including but not limited to council and family visitation policies. I also invite the parties to indicate if the latest measures implemented by the registry respond to their concerns. Mr. Roche, please. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, as you will be aware from previous submissions from the registry, we have, throughout the pandemic, sought to uh, safeguard the health and safety of detainees while um, ensuring adequate access to counsel. Um, as of the 15th, uh, sorry, as of the 1st of July, uh, in-person council visits were facilitated and as of the 15th of July uh, they have been in the same room um, and those have been proceeding um, well. There have been uh, each um, detainee in this case has had uh, a number of visits from council and or members of their team um, with the exception of uh, one and uh, who has had members of the team, not ju just not council. Um, as of the 6th of September the remaining restrictions on um, personal visits have been removed. So as of the 15th of July, close personal relatives could visit um, and have done so on many occasions. And as of the 6th of September, other personal visits are now uh, possible. And this has led to a significant increase in the number of visitors uh, to the detention facilities. More generally, we continue to work with the medical officer to uh, ensure that it is a safe environment for detainees and all those who are uh, required to be present there. And um, if there are any more specific issues that um, arise, I will endeavour to answer them uh, as best I can. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Does any of the defence team want to react? Nothing from Mr. Mr. Thaji. Mr. Kihui? Mr. Emerson? Nothing at all. Mr. Young? No, thank you. Ms. Lagendra? Nothing to add, Your Honour. Thank you very much. And let me now move to the next and I think uh, close to last point on the agenda related to defence investigations. Uh, the Krasniki defense indicated in its written submissions that the defense have commenced their investigations but remain constrained by various factors. I would be interested to hear the defense regarding the status of their investigations, in particular based on the SPO's estimates and the ongoing disclosure process 
whether the defense can provide more information on the status of their investigations, whether the defense can provide information on any intention to make requests concerning unique investigative opportunities, person to rule 991, and whether the defense can provide information on any intention to give notice of an alibi or grounds for excluding responsibility. Mr. Kihui. Yes, Your Honor. I've given the circumstances and the disclosures. Uh, I can't give Your Honor any estimate as to when any investigation is going to take place or com be completed better still. Are we reviewing the information that's come, uh, the disclosures made by the prosecution? Absolutely. Are we talking to our fellow counsel? Absolutely. Is there difficulty getting in and out of uh, Kosovo because of COVID? I think Your Honor understands that that's been a difficulty for everyone. Uh, but there are so many difficulties, redactions, and hurdles that have been put up by the prosecution. It has made any investigation immeasurably difficult. I raised the, the simple issue of an indictment, and Your Honor raised the notice of alibi. We have paragraph after paragraph of charges in this indictment that say a particular event took place in this locale between redacted 1999 and redacted 1999. That's not just one paragraph. I'm sure Your Honor knows that the, the indictment is replete with those types of uh, of uh, redactions that make it virtually impossible to even consider whether or not my client, who I will tell you was operating on an international level throughout Europe while all these difficulties were taking place and was not in the theater of operations for most of the time, it makes it impossible to take any position on a variety of those issues. Now, as an officer of the court, do I think there's going to come a time and place when a variety of issues come to the fore, when my client was either in Brussels or Rome or London or, or, or Vienna? Yes, but I cannot give you that information now because I'm looking at an indictment that I don't even know what I'm facing. And that was why I, I would hoped at the outset, at least in the next couple of days, I will take the next couple of weeks, we will get an unredacted indictment uh, from the prosecution so we can address this issue, which by its very nature will focus our investigation. Because at this point, we can't. We can take this information and how this information directly reflects or, or pertains to the charges in the indictment. In some cases, it's impossible. So that's a long answer to say that we are unprepared to give the status of the investigation at this point. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe. Uh, Mr. Emerson, please. Uh, we, we, we um, <clears throat> on behalf of Mr. Vasili, are we've significantly started the investigation insofar as we are able to do. We have a team uh, established in Kosovo, and we have visits that have taken place to begin the process of, of uh, identifying potential witnesses from the cases we're able to so far discern it. If indeed Your Honour does uh, issue a direction that the prosecution serve their pre-trial brief by the 31st of October, that will very significantly assist in defining lines of inquiry um, and, uh, and investigation. Um, the, the only thing I want to say, and I'm saying this publicly on the record, is that um, different jurisdictions have different terms for this, but in our jurisdiction, the rule is that there is no property in a witness. In other words, we're investigating at the moment without any restriction on who we speak to, and we do not regard ourselves as under any obligation to notify the prosecution about whoever we wish to speak to, because the prosecution at this stage has failed to nail its colours to the mast or even identify which witnesses it intends to call. So as matters stand, the defence investigation considers itself free to in, in, make any inquiries uh, that it uh, judges appropriate without notification to the prosecution or the court. And if anybody disagrees with that, I'd invite them to indicate now and to explain their reasons. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Young, please. Yes, Your Honour, briefly, thank you. Well, for the reasons um, in the main articulated by Mr. Kehoe, and uh, also really by virtue of the fact it's really unclear what the, the actual prosecution case is against uh, Mr. Recep Salini. I'm not able to assist the court today in relation to these issues. Thank you, Mr. Young. Ms. Alagandra, please. Uh, Your Honour, I know Your Honour will in the following weeks uh, set a deadline for the pre-trial brief, but may I say at this stage that the filing of the pre-trial brief 
will not be an indication at all of the defense readiness uh, for trial. The difficulties we face on investigations continue. We have, uh, uh, we have put it in our written submissions. I stand by that. And I also join my learned friends on the various issues that are confronted by the defense. Um, for that reason, we are unable to give any further update uh, on the status of investigations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Legendra. Does the SPO want to say anything on this uh, item of the agenda? Just re with respect to the point raised by the Vasali defense, we that is obviously a complicated matter, um, contacting witnesses, which is regulated before many institutions, and we reserve the, the right to um, make further submissions on that issue in writing. Thank you. This is noted. Let me move to the uh, one of the last uh, item in our agenda, which is the date of the next uh, status conference. I inform the parties that uh, given that trial panel one will start the trial of case five tomorrow and trial panel two will start the trial of case seven early October, the availability of the courtroom will be limited in the following weeks for pre-trial status conferences in our case. After consulting with the other panels, I inform the parties that I intend to schedule the next status conference on Friday 29 October at 14.30 Hague time, 2.30 p.m. I also inform the parties that a time slot has already been reserved for the last status conference of the year on Wednesday, 15 December at 14.30 Hague time, 2.30 p.m. Uh, let me give the floor to all parties and participants. Uh, Madam Prosecutor. Um, we will be available at the dates indicated by Your Honour, and there are no further matters we wish to raise. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Mr. Kihu. Yes, thank you, Your Honour. We will be available. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Mr. Emerson. Likewise. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Young. Yes, briefly. Your Honour, can I say, uh, regrettably, the date of the 29th of October is difficult for me. I'm wondering if Your Honour would be good enough to consider a date in the week following, in the first week of November. Um, if Your Honour would prefer for submissions to be made in writing, that can be done. But um, the, the, the one date I, I do have a professional difficulty is the Friday, the 29th of October. So I would be grateful if you could put it back a day or two or a few days into the first week in November, if at all possible. I will consult my colleagues, but I uh, cannot promise anything because the uh, schedule uh, is a very complicated uh, organizational task. Uh, would your <coughs> co-consul be available should the date not be able to uh, be moved? Um, I believe Mr. Roberts is here. Perhaps he can assist. Mr. Roberts. Thank you. This is noted. And uh, I will see what is possible to do, Mr. Young. But I cannot promise anything. Can, can I just say, I would object to Mr. Young's application because I think that the next status conference needs to be before the 31st of October deadline. So I would object to that request. Um, Your Honour, just to, just to shorten matters, if Mr. Roberts is available on the date, on that date, that's fine. I'm not seeking in a, a, it to be put back, just to reassure Mr. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Young. This is much appreciated, and I would indeed prefer to have our status conference before the 31st of October. Uh, Ms. Alegandra, please. We are available, uh, Your Honour, at the court's convenience. Thank you, Ms. Alegandra. Mr. Laws, please. Uh, yes, I'll be available. Thank you. Thank you very much. You will receive a scaling order that will include an agenda before each status conference in due course. I also invite the parties, as usual, to make written submissions if they would like to raise any specific issue during the next status conference. Uh, at this point, I would like to ask the parties whether they have any other issues they would like to raise. Madam Prosecutor, I think you already responded to this, but uh, you have the floor again. Yes, nothing further. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor. Mr. Kihu? Put a deadline on the ongoing investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kihu. Mr. Emerson, please. Nothing further. 
Thank you, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Young, please. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Young. Mr. Lagendra, please. Nothing further, Your Honor, other than whether or not we would be required to put in a written submission for extension of time on the 1023 material or requests. Sorry, can you repeat? I didn't get your, your point. Whether or not uh, we would be required to put in a written submission for the 1023 uh, requests. No, or because... Your order making a decision on it. No, because I intend to issue an oral order today. I'm grateful, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Legendra. Let me now uh, issue a couple of oral orders following our debates today. I will issue my first oral order concerning the subcategorization of Rule 1021A material. I recall my decision on categorization of evidence issued on 12 March 2021, wherein I decided that no further categorization was needed in respect of Rule 1021A material, as the defense already benefited from the meticulous guidance provided in the detailed outline prepared by the SPO, person to rule 86.4 of the rules. I further note that rule 1021A material does benefit from the application of standard rule 109C categories in legal workflow. In this context, I find that the time and resources that would be required to apply subcategorization to rule 1021A material would slow the disclosure process and add little value in light of the tools already available to categorize such material. I accordingly deny the defense request for subcategorization of rule 1021A material. This concludes my first oral order. I will issue my second oral order concerning the SPO's deadline related to Rule 1021B material. In light of SPO submissions that certain external factors have delayed disclosure of, first, the statements of three international witnesses with pending Rule 107 clearances. Second, reports of three expert witnesses on forensic matters. And third, certain materials subject to requests for variation of protective measure. The current Rule 1021B deadline for such material is varied and the SPO is ordered to disclose such material to the defense by 1st November 2021. As regards translation of Rule 1021B material, I order the SPO to provide outstanding translations as soon as possible and on a rolling basis, but no later than 1st November 2021. Any requests for an extension of time in relation to the translation and slash or Disclosure of the outstanding Rule 1021B material should be made in writing and detail the material to which it pertains by Wednesday, 27 October 2021. This concludes my second oral order. I will issue my third oral order concerning defense deadlines in relation to Rule 1023 material. With respect to the defense request to extend the deadline for requesting access to Rule 1023 material, good cause for such an extension has been shown in light of, first, the vast number of documents on the SPO's, OSPO's Rule 1023 notice, and second, the fact that assessment of materiality would be aided by review of the SPO's Rule 1021B disclosure. The deadline for all defense teams to request Rule 1023 material, as set out in my 24 June 21 decision and recalled in my 8 September 2021 decision on the amended Rule 1023 notice, is accordingly extended 
to 5 November 2021. I further order the SPO by no later than Friday 26 November 2021 or within three weeks of the defense indication, whichever is earlier, to first disclose or provide access to the selected material that does not require reductions, second submit a request for protective measures, if any, in respect of the material sought by the defense and to disclose as soon as possible such material with reductions if granted. And third, I order the SPO to seize me within 10 days of the defense indications should a dispute as to the materiality of the evidence arise. Finally, the deadline for requesting further details remains. This concludes my third oral order. I will finally issue a fourth oral order concerning the filing of a preliminary witness list. In light of the party's submissions, I order the SPO to provide a preliminary witness list to the defense by 22 October 2021. This concludes my fourth and last oral order today. This concludes today's public hearing. I thank the parties and participants for their attendance. I also wish, as usual, to thank the interpreters for their flexibility, stenographers, audiovisual technicians, and security personnel for their assistance. This hearing is adjourned. All rise.